As Donnie said, uh, my name is Jonathan Snyder, uh, and I have the honor and privilege of serving our executive pastor here at Antioch. And anytime I'm around here, anytime I speak on a Sunday, I say this. It is such an honor and a privilege to be a part of this church. Uh, I've been a part of this church for, since the beginning, since uh, close to seven years ago. And guys, God has done amazing things. As you and I as a community have come together and opened up the book of Acts and said, hey, how can we live this out? How can we love God more? And how can we love people more? We have seen God move. And guys, I want to encourage you, don't let what we do become familiar. Um, a buddy of mine was in town this past uh, Wednesday from out of town, and it came to our young adult life group. And we had over 30 people, and we had breakfast for dinner, and we're worshiping together, we're praying together. It was awesome. And we're, we're driving back home, and, and my buddy said, it is incredible, the community that you guys have here. He's like, it is incredible to see so many young adults come together worshiping me. And so I just want, worshiping God. Uh, so I just want to encourage you guys, <laughs> worshiping God. Um, and so I just want to encourage you guys, don't let what we do become familiar. And speaking of familiar, is there a little feedback? Are we good? Awesome. Speaking of familiar, I just want to take a little moment to honor our lead pastors, Donnie and Brianna. Uh, so often I see them every single day, and they're just familiar. Give them a hand clap. I get to see you guys every day, and so often it feels familiar. But I just want to encourage you guys that you guys lead with such humility and grace, the both of you. The way you guys carry yourselves, we can all learn from you guys. And Donnie, you say this often, but you say, my job as a lead pastor is not to make much of myself, but to make much of other people. And I just want to say, you, Brianna, even your kids, you guys do that so well. So we love you and we're thankful for you. Amen, church? Amen, Amen guys. Well, if you've been with us for any amount, amount of time this summer, you know that we are in a series entitled Practical Faith. We have been week by week deep, di deep diving into the book of James. It's five chapters, and week by week we've been looking at that. And James' big premise is this right here. It's that our faith is not meant to be internalized or rationalized alone, but our faith is meant to be lived out practically. And so James, each and every week, we have been looking at ways that he talks about. He hits trials and temptations. He hears talking about being hearers and doers of the Word of God. He talks about faith and works. He talks about forbidden favoritism. And last week, Donnie talked about how unity starts with you. And James's big premise is that our faith is meant to be lived out practically. And, and James kind of, if you're familiar with James, you kind of know that he's the half-brother of Jesus. So a lot of his writings are reflected by the teachings of Jesus. Not only that, he had the book of Proverbs. So a lot of his writings, while they reflect the teachings of Jesus, they kind of have the style structure of the book of Proverbs. And unlike Paul, Paul used to write to specific churches and correct different things with specific churches. But James is more so speaking to Christians at large. He's saying, as Jesus followers, this is what I'm calling you to. And this morning, I want to look at James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. And James' big idea is this right here, is that as Christians, as Jesus followers, you and I ought to live uh, through this lens of patience and suffering. I'll say that again. As Jesus followers, you and I are supposed to live through this lens of patience in suffering. And you might say, well, what is, how does James have this authority to preach on this? Uh, and if you know the story of James, James was super adamant about his faith. He was adamant about his faith, so much, to, so much so to even the point of death. The community was mad that he was lifting up the name of Jesus. And so literally what they did was they pushed him off, the, off of a temple to kill him. And when he didn't die, they literally encircled him and beat him to death. And just like Jesus, history records that his final words were also, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So whenever we look at this idea of patience and suffering, James, he has a resume that can teach on that. So I want to look at that this morning. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. It starts with this. It says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, and you have seen the end intended by the Lord. It's this, is that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. I want to pray one more time before we jump in. Jesus, we just thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you uh, for James. God, we thank you for him even laying down his life. And this morning, as we dive into Scripture, 
God, I just pray that you would speak to each of us, God, that each of us would be changed. God, I want to be some behavior modification where we change in our own, God, but you would do something on the inside of, both, of each of us, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I gotta, some of you guys who know me probably know this about me, but I, I do have a confession to make this morning. I am extremely lazy. I, I'm, I'm super productive at work, but I am extremely lazy. If you get around me, whenever I get home from work, the first thing I'm looking for is I'm looking for a blanket and I'm looking for the couch. That's the first thing I do. And if I come to your house, chances are the first thing I'll do is I'll take off my shoes. And once my shoes are off, I'm looking for, where's your couch at? I'm looking for the most comfortable couch in the house. And then last but not least, I'm looking for that little basket that you have at your house that has the blankets. And I'm going to find the most comfortable blanket. And I, if I'm at your house for any period of time, I will take a nap. And here's the thing. I don't blame you for this. I kind of blame you guys. More so, I blame, yeah, I blame you. I blame our society at large. Basically, every single invention that comes out, technology after technology, every single technological advance, here, here's, what, here's the design. It's to make life more efficient and more comfortable. Everything, like every single app, every single technology, is to make life more efficient and comfortable. And so just to give you an example, like I could be on my couch, wrapped up in my blanket, as I so often am. I could be watching Netflix, answering emails on my phone. I can order takeout, and I could just remain lazy. Like, like technology has allowed me that right. Prime example, uh, a couple weeks ago, or not, actually it's longer than that, but a while back, we, I love having people over at our house for breakfast. So we had a bunch of people over at our house for breakfast on a Saturday morning. And the first thing you might think, if you know me, is, Johnny, you don't cook. And, and that's true. And here's the reason why I was scarred my uh, freshman year of college. Tried making cinnamon rolls. And I, I, don't, I don't go to the kitchen much, but I, ha I had this can of cinnamon rolls. And I started looking around the kitchen for a can opener. And uh, if you make cinnamon rolls, you know, yes, you got it. So I asked my roommate, I was like, hey, where's, where's the can opener? And he's like, what's what for? And I was like, open these cinnamon rolls. And he just takes them out of my hand politely, and he just starts unraveling them, and he does a little pop thing. And, and midway through that, it just starts hitting me. I, I don't need a can opener. Like, I, I know how to make cinnamon rolls. My parents made them for me growing up. This is pretty simple. But that's not even the point of the story. The point of the story is we had people at my house for breakfast, so a bunch of people at my house for breakfast. And, and one of my friends who I invited, she couldn't make it. Her name's Darian. So, I, so Darian calls me the morning of breakfast. And I was wondering why I got a call from her. And, and she says, hey, Johnny, she said, I lost my keys. I lost my car keys. I'm trying to get to New Orleans for a photography gig. Can you, can you give me my spare key? You have my spare key. And I said, well, Darian, I said, I've got people over at my house for breakfast. And she said, I know, but it's not like you're cooking. You can't even make cinnamon rolls. And I said, Darian, <laughs> chill out for a second. I, I was like, Darian, you've got to chill. I was like, I got you on speakerphone. I got friends around. Like, chill out. I said, hey, I, I will get you your keys, but give it a couple minutes. I I'll get them to you. So I hang up, and the first couple things I think of, the first thing was, I was thinking, the, the first thing I thought of was, I could go bring her the cinnamon rolls. Like, I, I could do that. I mean, I could bring her the uh, key. Uh, I could get off the couch and bring her the key. But I was like, it's the weekend, I've got people over, not doing that. The second option was I could ask someone else at my house, hey, can you bring her a key? But that would have been a little insensitive because I'm on the couch, I'm doing nothing, I'm not even cooking. So the third option was this. I, I called Darian back a few minutes later, and I said, hey, Stephanie is going to be at your house in about 12 minutes. She is bringing you the key. And Darian said, Stephanie who? I was like, you know, Steph, Stephanie, like Stephanie. She said, I, I don't know, Stephanie. I, I said, Stephanie, like, you know, Steph. She said, I don't know who that is. I said, you know, Stephanie. I said, Stephanie uh, has that white Honda Accord, license plate V as in Victor, R as in Rooster, C as in Charlie, 297. I said, you know her. She's got that 4.93 out of five-star review on Uber. You have to know her. And Darian said, you mean to tell me you gave my key to an Uber driver? And I said, yeah, I mean, what's the harm? She's like, well, she has my address. She has my key. She could steal my car. I said, well, well, Darian, here's the thing. Like, she's an Uber driver. She has a car. Like, she's not trying to steal yours. <laughs> and, and Darian said, true. She said, but do they allow you, like, to make deliveries? Like, does Uber allow you? I said, well, not necessarily. But when Stephanie got to my house, she thought she was picking me up. And so I go up to the window. I said, hey, huge favor. Can you bring this key to the address? And Stephanie said, well, I don't know, like our terms and conditions with Uber, they re really don't allow for that. And so what I did was I bribed Stephanie. I said, Stephanie, here's a plate of food. Here's some eggs. Here's some bacon. Here's my famous cinnamon rolls that everybody talks about. Here's a plate for you. Here's a plate for Darian. Can you bring her the key? She said, I think.
think I can make that work. And so long story short, Darian gets her key. Stephanie got another five-star review on Uber. And last but not least, uh, technology allowed me to remain efficient and comfortable. And so story over. But if you look at James chapter 5, there's almost this disconnect for me. I don't know about you, but I like to remain comfortable. I like to remain lazy. And when James talks, he talks a lot about patience and suffering. Like, there's almost this disconnect. Like, James comes across as his great-grandparent, like, at Christmas, talking about the printing press. Like, like back in my day, we had the printing press. It's like, well, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got Instagram. I, I really don't care about the printing press, Grandma. And, and James comes across that way. He seems a little out of touch. But how many of you know that when it comes to following Jesus, the longer that we follow Jesus for, we realize very early on that you and I, we need patience. We, need, we, we will suffer. Earlier, I talked about how we live out the book of Acts, and, and it sounds like this perfect utopia. We come together, we pray, we worship, we meet each other's needs. Um, people are added to our number daily, those that are saved. We eat a bunch of food. That, that sounds awesome, but how many of you know that the longer you stay in community, you realize that everyone in the Acts 243-47 community is still human. Everyone still brings in the same sin. They bring in the same baggage. They bring in their sin, their shame, their guilt, their pride. They bring in all of that. And so very quickly, we, we, we learned that we have to be patient in suffering. Jesus, he, he was a model of this. He said, while culture teaches today that we need to be efficient and comfortable, I'm teaching. I have that upside-down paradox. I'm teaching you that you need to be patient in suffering. So I want to go back to James. James lays out five things in verses 7 through 11 to help us out on this journey. Let's look at James chapter 5, verse number 7. It says this. It says, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The first thing, if you're taking notes, that James encourages you and I to do is that we have to be patient. And that some of that may seem obvious. You're like, duh, we have to be patient. He says it. But, but the reason why I want to hit this point is that if we're on two different pages about what patience is, we will miss the rest of this message. You and I, we have to be on the same page about what patience is. Whenever I think about patience, kind of my first thought is me being stuck in traffic with like a bunch of friends. Like, I'm always the one with like, how much more time do we have? Are we close? Are we there yet? And typically my friends are like, hey, we're an hour out. And for that hour, I try to be patient. I try to, you know, say, I- I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be patient. But once we hit that 61st minute, I lose my stuff. Immediately, I just lose it. But according to James, like, even that first hour of me being patient is not patience. I, I think so, I think more so, He's saying that might be good willpower, that might be good discipline, but that's not patient. James teaches you and I when we say, how long must I be patient? He says, until the coming of the Lord. It's kind of comical. He wrote that 2,000 years ago, and he's saying, be patient until the coming of the Lord. And it's like, so you want me to spend my entire life being patient? And the answer is yes. The first thing that James teaches you and I about patience is that patience is not predetermined. Write that down. Patience is not predetermined. It's not this spot on our calendars that we can mark and say, I will be patient until October 7th at noon. I'm going to be patient till then. No. James says, be patient until the coming of the Lord. He's saying, your entire lives, you must exhibit patience. Well, well how do we do that? Second sub point is this, that patience is a posture. Basically, patience is a posture of you and I's heart. And it's, it, it, a patient heart basically says this. It says that, God, while my external circumstances may never change on earth, While nothing may change, I choose to trust that you are good and that you are working everything out for good. Guys, we got to be patient. Point number one is be patient. He continues in verse number eight, and he says this. He says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He says, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. The the second thing that James encourages you you and I is that we have to establish our hearts. And you might say, well, what does that look like? What does that mean? mean to have an established heart. No. The way I kind of define it is this. I need to get a word for God for myself, for every area of my life, so that when times get tough, I have something to stand on, so that I don't lose hope. And, and, and so when it comes to establishing our heart, we have to get a word from God. We have to get a word for God. For example, about a year ago, I asked God, I said, God, what are you calling me to in my role here at Antioch? And I felt like God said this. He said that while the church plant team came, their main role was to lay the foundation. And and right now it's healthy and it's built for us to grow on. Like it is firm, it's solid. I want you to be around to see this church grow and reach Baton Rouge and the nations of the earth. 
And so that's the word that I got from God. So, for example, like when times get tough at work, while I work at a church, we still have bad days. We still have good days. And so whenever I go home, it'd be very easy some days to say, man, I don't want to do this anymore. But, I, but, but because my heart is established, I have a promise for the future, and I know what God's called me to. So the first thing is we have to establish our hearts. And the way we do that, if you're taking notes, I, I'd ask you to ask yourself this question this week. What is, uh, what is the last thing that I sense God in, uh, instructed me to do? What is the last thing that I sense God instructed me to do? And some of you guys might say, well, I, I don't know what God instructed me to do. And that's not a bad spot to be in. I think there's three things, three or more sub points that I, I want you to do this week. If you say, I don't have a word, ask yourself these three questions for every area of your life, your relationships, your marriage, your finances, your occupation, the place you live. Ask yourself these questions right here. What do I sense God is speaking to me? What do you sense God is speaking to you? And you might say, well, I think this is God. I'm not sure. And the second way that you can know that if that's God speaking to you is, does it align with Scripture? Whenever you have that word from God, does it actually align with Scripture? If it doesn't, if it contradicts Scripture, spoiler alert, it's probably not God. Actually, it's not God. Um, and then secondly, if it lines up with Scripture, you're more so on, on the trail of saying, I hear God. But here's the third thing you can do. Ask your community. Ask people in your life groups and your discipleships, hey, I'm sensing this from God. It actually lines up with Scripture. What, what do you think about this? When you pray about this, do you have a peace? Do you think this is God? And if so, if you got all three of those checks, chances are, chances are it's God. And so the first thing I want you to do this week is ask yourself, God, what's the last thing that you instructed me to do? And I know sometimes that's a very big question, a very broad question. And so more of a bite-sized question, question number two I want you to ask this week is this right here. What are you speaking? What are you instructing me to do today? It's more bite-sized. It should line up with that bigger vision. If God's instructing you to, uh, he says, hey, I want you to give more than ever away, chances are today he's probably not speaking for you to go buy a car. Like, like it should line up. The big vision should line up with the vision for today. And just when it comes to hearing God, I just kind of ask you this. Never, or if at all possible, never ask these two questions when emotions are high. If your emotions are high and you had a bad day at work and you come home saying, I want to quit, you probably shouldn't ask God, God, what are you instructing me about my job? Should I quit? Like, you're going to hear what you want to hear. And typically, God's not screaming at you. God, was, he, whenever he speaks, it's typically in a whisper. So I want you to ask these questions whenever emotions are cool. Whenever you have a good day at work, ask, hey, God, I love my job, but what are you speaking to me? Point number one, we got to be patient. Point number two, we have to establish our hearts. Point number three is this. I want to go to James chapter five, verse number nine. It says this. It says, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. I think the third point you might think I could talk about this morning is like us taming our tongue. And that's a portion of it. But here's the bigger deal. I want to hit the root of why do you and I grumble? Why do you and I gossip? Why do you and I complain about one another? Point number three is this. I think you and I have to avoid comparison. Whenever I compare you to me and me to you, it's just not fair. Whenever you and I compare, it breeds disunity. As a community, as Antioch Baton Rouge, we cannot be comparing one another to one another. It only breeds separation. And here's the thing. Whenever I compare you to me and me to you, here's what I do. Typically, when I compare, I judge myself based on my intentions and we all do that. We judge ourselves based on our intentions, and we judge other people based on their actions. And that is not equal. That's not an equal playing field. We have to, we, for, at all possible, we have to avoid comparison. We have to avoid comparison. I think a great question you can ask yourselves this week right here is this right here. It's, do I believe the best? Ask yourself this question this week. Do I believe the best. I think you should ask this about a couple different relationships. Ask yourself this question, do I believe the best in my family? And I don't know about you, but for me, when it comes to believing the best in my family, sometimes that's difficult. Like whenever you're around people a lot and you see, their be- you see them at their best and you see them at their worst, it's hard to believe the best. But here's the thing, believing the best is not about that person changing. That's not the goal of believing the best. Believing the best is about you and I having, keeping that relationship, keeping that healthy relationship. And also, believing the best is about guarding our hearts against comparison. That's the whole point of believing the best. So first question is, do I believe the best about my family? Second thing is this, 
do I believe the best about my coworkers and boss? Ask yourself that this week. Do I believe the best about my coworkers and boss? Chances are you'll probably see them this week more than you see your family. Third question is this. Do you believe the best in your spiritual authority? People like your life group leaders, the person that disciples you, our pastoral staff here in Antioch, our elders, do you believe the best in your spiritual authority? And here's why I think you should. God literally says in his word that all authority, both your earthly boss and even your spiritual authority, have been given by God. Do you believe the best in your spiritual authority? And last but not least, do you believe the best in God? And for me, man, it's very easy. If you're dealing with like a financial need, come get me. I'll pray for you. I'll believe that God's going to meet that need. If you're sick, call me up. I will believe and I will have faith that God will heal you. Call me about any impossible situation and I'm willing to pray for you and stand for you and believe that God's going to do it. But typically, when it comes to do I believe the best in God, sometimes I'm like, I, 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 my problem's not as big as yours or not as big as that person. So, God, I trust that you're good, but you don't have to worry about healing me. I only have strep throat. I'll get a shot. I'll take another nap. I'll be fine soon. God, you don't have to worry about that. But here's the thing. Do you believe the best about God for yourself? Can you say that? Here's a great indicator. You ask yourself that this week. Don't just write yes or no on a piece of paper. Here's here's a great indicator right here. Your words. What are you speaking? What are you speaking? The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart. So what you truly believe will come out. The Bible also says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. So are you choosing to speak words of life or are you choosing to speak words of death? There's really no in-between and it's really that simple. Point number one, we've got to be patient. Point number two, we've got to establish our hearts. Point number three, we have to avoid comparison. Point number four, I want to look at verses number 10 and 11 from James chapter 5. James continues and he says, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the person of Job, and you have seen the end intended by the Lord. It's this right here, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Point number four is that we have to endure well. You might say, well, well how do I do that? How do I endure well? I, th- I think James lays out a great, two great examples for you and I. The first thing he says is remember the prophets. He says, remember the prophets. And whenever you think about the prophets, you might say, well, what does that mean? But whenever the people reading this back in the day, or whenever he was sharing this back in the day, this is what they would have thought of. They would have thought of Hebrews 11. And I'm not going to put that on the screen, but basically Hebrews 11, what they were thinking of were people like Abraham, people like Isaac, people like Jacob, people like Joseph, people like Moses who sensed the word from God, they walked out by faith, they trust God's wisdom, and they saw God's promise come to pass here on earth. They would have thought about those people, people who, once again, trusted God, walked out by faith, trusted wisdom, and and saw God, saw the promise of God happen here on earth. But then they also would have thought about these other prophets, almost the the nameless prophets from from Hebrews 11, the end of 11. It talks about these people. It says, it says, and there were others, nameless people, who were tortured, refusing refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning and they were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went out in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. These people remembered these prophets, the prophets who at one point in time believed God, trusted God, and then said this, I didn't see the promise here on earth. I didn't see God answer the promise the way I thought he would. I'll take that. Thank you. Is this better, guys? Good. Sorry about that. So, 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 so these people would have thought about the prophets that were named, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you name it. And they also would have thought about the nameless prophets. They would have thought about people who did not see the promise answered. And so here's a point that you and I can remember for the prophets is this right here. Ask yourself this question. Do I trust God's wisdom? Do you trust God's wisdom? And you might say, well, yeah, obviously I trust God's wisdom. Well, James continues and he says, remember Job. And I'm not going to, once again, we're not going to put it on the screen for a sake of time, but the big picture of Job is this. Job was married, had seven kids, was wealthy, was healthy, had a great reputation. Job had it all together, and long story short, overnight, he loses everything. 
He loses everything. And his wife tells him this. He says, you should curse God and die. Job has some friends, and they said, actually, you know what this means, Job? It means that God is not just. He's not just. There's no way. But what we read about in Job throughout all the chapters of Job, we read this, that Job does not stop there. He doesn't say this can't mean God is not just. I shouldn't die. He says this. He says, I have to wrestle with God. While I don't understand what God is doing, while this doesn't make sense in my life, I am choosing to trust God. I'm going to wrestle with him. I'm going to bring my hardships to him, trusting that he is good. We have to remember the prophets. We have to remember, do I trust God's wisdom? And secondly, we have to remember, Job, have you ever wrestled with God? Have you ever been honest with God enough where you said, hey, this hardship has happened in my life. It doesn't make sense at all. And God, here's where I'm at. I don't know about you, but for me, typically, I don't go there with God. Those, those situations where I should wrestle with God, I avoid talking about with people, with God, and I just pretend like it never happened. But what James is encouraging you, if you, if you and I are going to endure well, if we're going to stick this out and truly love Jesus, is that we have to remember the prophets. We've got to remember Job. And point number five is this right here. James chapter five, verse number seven. I, I skipped the second part of verse number seven. You might have realized that. But I want to go back to it right now. James says this. He says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently until it receives the early and the latter rain. Do you notice that the farmer, he, he's not, it doesn't say that he waits for the sun. If I was a farmer, I'm not, but typically I'd probably think he waits for the sun. I'm not a farmer, but I'd probably think he waits for the harvest, but the Bible records that the farmer waits for the rain. Point number five, I want to encourage you guys is don't despise the rain. I think too often in life as Christians, as Jesus followers, we equate the absence of rain to the nearness of God. When things are good, when things are easy, we think God's near. And when things get tough, we think, well, God, where are you at? You must be distant. But the Bible says that the farmer, he, rate, he waits for the early and the latter rain. Guys, we can't despise the rain. We have to realize that God is working everything together for good. He's working everything together for good. And I, I'm not, once again, not a farmer, so I didn't know what the early and the latter rain meant, but I looked it up, and it says this right here. It says that the early rain represents the growth. Early rain represents growth. So could it be that the, the rain that you're experiencing today is representing the growth in your life? Could it be? It might not be the sun. It might not be the harvest, but it's actually the early rain that's representing the growth. And then it says the latter rain represents the maturity. It represents the fruit coming to full fruition. It represents the harvest. Could it be the rain that you're experiencing in your life today is actually representing the harvest of God? Guys, we've got to get this for ourselves. We've got to say, God, I don't understand why it's raining. I don't get this at all. But God, I choose to trust that you are good. We already talked about this at the beginning of our series, but James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says this. It says, and you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You could equate it to this. You know that the rain in your life is producing perseverance. Verse number 4, it says, and persever let, let perseverance finish its work so that you can be complete and mature, not lacking anything. Guys, I know I, I, know I went over a lot today, and I went over it pretty quick. I just want to recap it for you. James is instructing you and I that as Christians, as Jesus followers, we have to let go of this right to efficiency and comfortability. That's what our culture teaches. We have to let go of that right. And guys, we have to let latch on to the promise of Jesus. We have to be patient in suffering. James says for you to do that, here's five things. Number one, we got to be patient. We talked about how patience is actually a posture of our heart. Patience says, the patient heart says, God, I, I don't understand everything. Even if my external circumstances don't change, though, God, I trust that you are good. Number one, we've got to be patient. Number two, we've got to establish our hearts. Guys, this week we've got to ask ourselves this question. What is the last thing that I sense God instructed me to do? And once we have that word, we do that. Number three, we've got to avoid comparison. This week let's ask ourselves the question, do I believe the best? Do I truly believe the best? And don't just once again ask yourself that and write down, yes, I believe the best. No, I believe that. No, I don't. But truly evaluate your words. That's the great indicator. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Let's be people that speak words of life. Amen.
Point number four is this, guys. We've got to endure well. If you and I are going to endure well as Christians, if we're going to stick this thing out as Antioch, Baton Rouge, we cannot be people uh, quick to run whenever we have to endure. We, ha- we can't be people who are quick when suffering rises to leave. We've got to stick this thing out. And the way we do that is we remember the prophets. We remember that the prophets trusted the wisdom of God. We have to ask ourselves that question this week. Do I trust God's wisdom? Not only that, we have to remember Job. We have to ask ourselves this question. Have I wrestled with God? Have you gone there with God? And last but not least, we can't despise the rain. Even though things may come up in life and it doesn't make sense, we cannot despise it. We have to realize that God is working all things together for good. The early rain in our lives is producing some growth and the latter rain is producing maturity. Amen? Amen. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. We're going to go into a time of ministry time. And basically what that'll look like is we're going to sing one more song. And anytime we meet together at Antioch, whether that be Sunday service, life group, or discipleship, we say this right here. We never want anyone to leave with a need unmet. Whether that be spiritually, physically, financially, emotionally, we do not want you to leave with a need unmet. So if you have a need, we want to invite you to come get prayer. If you're on our prayer team, you can start making your way forward quickly. The second two points are this. I think the action points from this message are this. Ask yourself this question. Have I wrestled with God? Have I gone there with God to the places that I've tried to avoid? And for me, here's what I've learned about my life is there's places that I won't wrestle with God and I won't talk to it about God. But when I bring someone else in, when I bring a life group leader in, when I bring someone who's praying for me in, they typically ask me this question. Have you told God that yet? My answer is always no, I haven't brought that to God. But what I found is that whenever I can, whenever I say, hey guys, I'm struggling with this, I haven't brought this to God to a person, it makes it easier for me to then go to God and say, God, I'm struggling with this. Why did this happen? This doesn't make sense. Second thing is this, if you find yourself in a rainy season, if you find yourself in a hard situation, We talked this morning about we're not going to despise the rain, but here's the thing that does not negate the fact that rainy seasons can be difficult. They can be hard. They can be stressful. If you find yourself in that situation, you're like, I need prayer. I need prayer. I need some perspective. I need someone to pray for me to give me perspective about the situation. I know I'm not going to despise it. I know God's growing me, but I need some perspective. I want to invite you to come get prayer. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to go into ministry time. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for what you're doing in each of our hearts, God. And we just, God, we thank you that you're good. God, we do let go of the right of efficiency and comfortability, God. And we cling to what you're doing. We cling to the patient life, the one that is willing to suffer with joy. Yeah, Jesus, I just thank you for each person here today. God, I pray that you fill each person with faith again, God. Faith that you are good. No matter their external circumstances, God, you are good and you're working everything out for good. In Jesus' name, amen.